In a world where strategic alliances and territorial disputes could alter history, long before Rome conquered the known world, before the legends of Hannibal and the fall of Carthage, before Rome became the undisputed master of the Mediterranean, there was a series of fierce and defining conflicts that set the stage for its eventual dominance. In the rugged hills of central Italy in the late 4th century BC, Rome clashed with the Samnites, a formidable group of mountain warriors. What began as a seemingly minor fight for land evolved into an epic saga of dominance, identity, and survival, now known as the Samnite Wars. But why is this crucial conflict so often overshadowed in world history? Stay with us until the end to uncover how this early war set the stage for the epic conquests to come and why it deserves to be remembered as a cornerstone in the history of Rome. Trust me, you won't want to miss it. In the early centuries of the first millennium BC, the territory of the Roman Republic extended to the river Liri, which served as a natural boundary separating the Romans from their southern neighbors residing in the Apennine Mountains. Within this mountainous region lay Samnium, located in south-central Italy. The Samnites were part of a larger group of Italic tribes, descending from Indo-European populations that migrated into the Italian peninsula during the Late Bronze Age and Early Iron Age. The rugged terrain provided them with natural defenses and essential resources for their way of life. Each tribe had its own local leaders, but they would unite for collective decisions, fostering a strong sense of communal loyalty and independence, traits integral to their culture. While the Romans were known for their disciplined legions, the Samnites distinguished themselves with their guerrilla warfare tactics and fierce dedication to their ancestral traditions. Young Samnite men were trained from childhood in the art of combat, and their warrior culture was deeply ingrained. They employed a unique fighting style, utilizing a distinctive weapon known as the Samnite sword, a short, double-edged blade ideal for close combat. Their military formations, known as Samnite phalanxes, featured dense, interlocking shields that provided superior protection and mobility on the battlefield, marking them as one of the fiercest tribes of their time. The need for additional resources and fertile land, driven by their agrarian lifestyle, growing population, and the limitations of their rugged terrain, spurred their desire to conquer neighboring territories. Starting in the 5th century BC, Various Italic tribes, including the Samnites, began moving out of the mountains in search of fertile lands near the coast. In the early 4th century BC, the Samnites began making forays into Campania, one of the most fertile regions in Italy even until today. This rich land, essential for agriculture, had become a coveted prize due to its ability to sustain a large population and alleviate the frequent famines. The Samnites, battle-hardened and resilient, constituted a considerable threat to the more rich but less militarily equipped Capuans, whose life on the Fertile Plains had softened them and left them vulnerable. In 343 BC, the Samnites attacked the Cittacini, a tribe living north of Campania. The Campani, led by the city-state of Capua, sent an army to assist the Cittacini but were defeated by the Samnites. Subsequently, the Samnites invaded Campania and won another battle on the plain near Capua. Facing relentless Samnite incursions, the Capuans sought help from Rome. However, due to the Treaty of Cassius, Rome was initially unable to intervene. This treaty imposed restrictions on Roman military actions to ensure mutual non-aggression, define territorial boundaries, and prevent military conflicts between Rome and the Samnites. Realizing the gravity of their situation, Capua and other cities in Campania formally surrendered their territories to Rome. The Roman Senate, recognizing the potential to expand Roman influence and secure the vital resources of Campania, seized this strategic opportunity and accepted the surrender. Rome dispatched envoys to them in an attempt to halt their raid, but the Samnites effectively quashed any hope of a diplomatic resolution. They brazenly informed the Roman envoys of their unwavering intent to wage war against Capua. To underscore their defiance, they audaciously conducted a raid on Campania in the presence of the Roman envoys, escalating the tension to a critical level. The news of these provocations ignited a fervent response in Rome, leading to the declaration of war against Samnium and the swift mobilization of two armies. Marcus Valerius Corvus commanded the First Army, 
which strategically encamped in Campania to defend against further incursions, while Aulus Cornelius Cossus led the second force, marching resolutely into Samnite territory. The fact that both consuls were present on the battlefield demonstrated Rome's serious commitment to the conflict and its confidence in the security of its own territory, as consuls at the time had the highest military power. This decisive and dual-pronged military response marked the earnest beginning of the first Samnite Wars. The Samnites, assuming the primary theater of war would be in Campania due to Rome's commitment to defending the region, prepared for a conflict in this fertile area. However, the first Roman consul to engage them, Marcus Valerius Corvus, took a different approach. He initiated contact at Mount Gaurus and strategically encamped his army at its base. The Samnites, drawn by their proximity to Capua and their ambition to seize the city, swiftly appeared. After several days of testing the enemy's strength with skirmishers, Marcus Valerius Corvus prepared his Roman army for a decisive battle. As the Romans marched out of camp, the battle that followed was fiercely contested, with neither side able to gain the upper hand. Recognizing the risk of a prolonged stalemate, or even defeat, if the battle dragged on, Valerius ordered a cavalry charge to break a hole in the Samnite lines and create an opening for his infantry. However, the charge failed, and the Roman cavalry had to retreat. Determined to shift the battle's momentum, Valerius dismounted and led a direct infantry assault. Despite his efforts, the Samnite defenses held firm, with both sides suffering significant losses. The battle was fiercely contested with the Samnites employing effective guerrilla tactics and the challenging terrain further complicating the conflict. The prolonged struggle, high casualties, and relentless efforts of the troops rendered the engagement particularly grueling. As daylight faded and the Romans grew exhausted, they launched one final, desperate assault. This last effort succeeded in breaching the center of the Samnite line, allowing the Romans to push through. However, the onset of nightfall halted their pursuit and prevented further devastation. The Samnites, retreating under the cover of darkness, later attributed their flight to the intimidating appearance of the Roman soldiers, whose eyes and expressions seemed menacing in the dim light. By morning, the Romans claimed the Samnite camp, and the Campani emerged to celebrate their victory. Despite their success, Roman soldiers considered the battle their most arduous battle they had ever fought. Approximately concurrently, or not too long afterward, Aulus Cornelius Cossus, the other consul, marched his army farther into Samnium. Because the Romans could only go as far as the few known passes, the region's rugged geography presented serious obstacles. The Samnites benefited from this, as they were familiar with their rough terrain. Cossus had no idea that the Samnites had taken over the nearby highlands, which overlooked a little valley that the Roman army would eventually have to cross. They set up an ambush by waiting on these high places for the Romans to come descending into the valley. When the Romans finally encountered the enemy, retreat was no longer an option, as they were in a perfect ambush location. Panicking in the unfamiliar terrain, the Romans struggled to adapt to the sudden and precarious situation. During the battle, P. Decius Mus, a Roman military tribune, noticed that the Samnites had overlooked a crucial hilltop overlooking their camp. With the consul's approval, Decius led a detachment of Hastati and Principes from one legion to seize the hill. The Samnites, caught off guard by Decius's maneuver, panicked and shifted their focus away from the main Roman force to confront his men. This distraction allowed Consul Aulus Cornelius Cossus and the bulk of the Roman army to withdraw to more advantageous terrain, escaping the Samnite ambush. Surrounded on the hilltop and isolated from the main Roman forces, Decius and his men faced the enraged Samnites. The Samnites, uncertain and hesitant to launch an immediate assault, chose instead to starve out the Romans, a decision that would soon prove costly. Surprised to find himself unattacked, Decius ventured out with his centurions to scout the Samnite fortifications. Upon returning to his camp, he quietly assembled his men and outlined his plan. A nighttime breakout, either by stealth or force, if discovered. As they moved cautiously through the gaps between Samnite pickets, the Romans were eventually spotted. The situation quickly escalated into chaos as Decius's men began shouting and cutting their way through the Samnite lines. With a decisive battle cry, 
Decius's troops charged, disrupting the Samnites and slicing through their defenses. Remarkably, Decius managed to lead his men through this perilous mission without losing a single soldier. The next morning, the Roman army celebrated the safe return of Decius and his men. Encouraged by this success, Publius urged Consul Aulus Cornelius Cossus and the other Roman leaders to swiftly attack the Samnite positions, anticipating that the Samnites would be disorganized and vulnerable. Agreeing with this assessment, Aulus quickly mobilized the Roman forces for battle. The Samnites, still scattered and disarrayed in the valley, struggled to arm themselves effectively. As a result, they were easily routed, and their camp was plundered. The ensuing battle was a decisive Roman victory. The Samnites, caught completely off guard and unprepared, were scattered and overwhelmed. The 30,000 Samnites who had taken refuge in their camp were killed, sealing the Romans' triumph. After the battle, the consul convened an army assembly to honor Decius. He was awarded a golden chaplet, a hundred oxen, and a white ox with gilded horns. Each soldier received double rations, an ox, and two tunics. In recognition of his heroism, the soldiers presented Decius with two grass crowns, one for saving the entire army and another for rescuing his own men. The grass crown was the highest military honor in Rome, awarded to commanders whose actions saved a legion or an entire army. This rare accolade was especially significant, as it was awarded by the army itself and acknowledged the commander's crucial role in their salvation. Decius, deeply honored, sacrificed the white ox and distributed the hundred oxen among his men, who also received a pound of meal and a pint of wine each. His leadership and valor earned him a place among Rome's most celebrated heroes, with even the Emperor Augustus commemorating his achievements three centuries later. Reeling from recent defeats, the Samnites decided to concentrate their forces at the city of Suisula in Campania. Marcus Corvus, swiftly informed of this gathering, executed a force march to the city, traveling light and leaving behind the usual baggage train. This allowed the Romans to set up an unusually small camp due to the constrained terrain. Upon discovering the Roman camp, the Samnites, accustomed to Roman military practices, mistook the modest camp for a sign of a smaller force, perhaps a mere scouting party. Eager to capitalize on their perceived numerical superiority, the common soldiers pressed for an immediate assault. However, the Samnite generals, sensing something was amiss, ordered a temporary stand-down to reassess the situation. As the Samnites struggled with diminishing supplies, they were forced to send out foraging parties shortly after their army settled at Suisula. This dire necessity revealed their deepening crisis. They had overestimated their own strength and underestimated the Romans, assuming that the small Roman camp was similarly impoverished and too weak to offer any serious resistance. This misjudgment would prove to be their downfall. Marcus Corvus, ever vigilant, seized this opportunity with strategic precision. Watching as the Samnite foraging parties departed in search of sustenance, he recognized a pivotal moment. Acting swiftly and decisively, Corvus commanded his full-sized Roman army to launch a surprise attack on the seemingly vulnerable Samnite camp. The Romans, moving with a coordinated and ruthless efficiency, struck as the Samnites were caught in a state of disarray, having been lulled into a false sense of security. The ensuing battle was a catastrophe for the Samnites. The Romans, propelled by both tactical superiority and the element of surprise, shattered the Samnite defenses with overwhelming force. The Samnites, already suffering from disorganization and fatigue, were unable to mount an effective defense. The Romans not only crushed the main Samnite force but also captured the foraging parties, ensuring that no opportunity for recovery was left for the Samnites.
the scale of the defeat was staggering. On that fateful day, approximately 40,000 Samnites fell, their losses marking the third consecutive Roman victory in a relentless series of conflicts. The third decisive victory against the Samnites marked a significant moment in Rome's military history. As the campaign season drew to a close, both consuls, Marcus Corvus and Aulus Cornelius Cossus, returned to Rome, where they were honored with grand triumphs. Yet, the war did not conclude immediately. Despite the cessation of major hostilities, the conflict lingered on paper for another two years until 341 BC. During this period, actual fighting diminished substantially, and the two sides eventually negotiated a peace treaty. This treaty bore striking similarities to the earlier agreements, but with a crucial addition, the formal recognition of the Roman Campanian Alliance. By consolidating control over Campania, Rome not only expanded its territorial reach, but also demonstrated its capability to decisively defeat its adversaries. The treaty, relatively lenient in its terms, allowed the Samnites to retain their independence, yet it unmistakably affirmed Roman supremacy in the region. This diplomatic approach reflected Rome's growing sophistication in balancing military conquest with political pragmatism. However, the lingering question of whether the renewed treaty of friendship would sustain long-term peace or merely set the stage for future conflicts remained. Given that this was only the first Samnite war, the resolution of this conflict did not mark the end of Rome's struggles with the Samnites. Instead, it set the stage for subsequent confrontations the subsequent wars would continue to shape the geopolitical landscape of ancient Italy, revealing the persistent and often contentious nature of Roman expansion and its interactions with neighboring peoples. See you in the next battle video. Leave a comment about the battle that you want us to go into depth about. Please do hit that thumbs up button below, don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.